All right. I feel like I need to start with a little bit of brief personal context for my purchase. In my Hemacross training, I've been looking for, for a while for a suitable sharp for my training in a variety of shorter, single-edged, one-handed weapons, such as Dusak, Messer, Falchion, Hanger Cutlass. My criteria was a blade between, say, 24 and 27 inches. Not too much curve. A little curve is fine. I don't like my swords too curved. I would also appreciate it to be designed in the hilt to be ambidextrous because I, I do train with both hands. And, well, I would also like, uh, I, do, I do prefer a lot of hand protection. Now, the problem with hand protection that goes beyond, say, a cross guard and knuckle bow, they tend not to be ambidextrous. So I figured I'd have to settle either for less hand protection or, or not, not ambidexterity. However, I think I collided with a happy accident when I searched the word cutlass at Chicago Knife Works and discovered uh, this rare unicorn, and I think it does tick all the boxes. This would be the Cold Steel Pirate, in quotation marks, cutlass. Okay, pretty much out of the box, no touch-up sharpness test. Now, is cutting paper a good test for a sword? Mm. But in this case, that's pretty impressive. Let's do the Kyle test. Not bad. How about sawing through a little bit of cardboard? Not razor sharp, but I would have to say very knife-like. All right, as usual, before we get into the blade, let's take a look at the scabbard that came with it, which, well, it's got some really impressive points and some matte points. The sword itself, made in India, probably by Windlass for cold steel, and it has certain of those features in common, again, good and bad. First of all, you're going to see the fixtures on it are, well, quite ornate, at least on at least on the one side, the side that would show if it was hooked onto your belt. And yes, it does come with a pretty sturdy belt or frog hook. Matching shape. A little bit of a knob on the end, but again, it's just it's just a one-sided design. It's actually pretty well done. Kind of kind of an ocean theme to it. It is Leather, pretty thick leather, stitched on one side, but, um, well, first of all, you can hear there's a little bit of rattle down here where there's a lot of space for the blade, and some of that's due to blade shape. Uh, retention is good, but, yeah, drawing it is a bit of a drag, shall we say, and there is some of that white paste uh, desiccant in there. Now, this is not a reinforced scabbard. It, it, it's just the leather, and that makes it definitely feel kind of cheap and squishy, but hey, it's a sheath, it works, and um, yeah, I, I'm not terribly happy or unhappy with it, I don't think it looks nice and it functions, and that's about what I've got to say about it. All right, let's talk about fit, finish, my initial impressions out of the box, and some things I feel like I need to do to this thing in terms of improvements, modifications. Though I will say I'm, I'm really impressed with what I received, even though I kind of bought it a little bit blind. It's not available on many websites, and those websites did not have complete stats. So I wasn't sure what I was getting. Now, found it best price by far, Chicago Knife Works. I'll put the link down in the description below. It's on so few websites, including not being on the Cold Steel websites at all. I'm not sure if this is a new product or a discontinued product or an exclusive product. If you guys have any other information, let me know in the comments. But what did I get? Well, 1075 Steel which is kind of an upgrade. A lot of, the, a lot of the cold steel swords tend to be 1055. Some of them have a higher carbon like this one, so that's nice. Blade length, 26 and a half inches, and this is where I get to start looking down at my notes to not be so American and give you the metric, 67 and a half centimeters. 
I was looking for something between, say, 25 and 27 inches, and, and I got it. Obviously, it's pretty wide for the length. We actually, it actually makes the blade look short. It's two inches wide, about five centimeters. It does have taper from the spine down to the edge, but, well, you saw me cut with it out of the box. It didn't do too bad, but it is a very steep secondary grind that's pretty toothy. One of the first things I'm going to do is improve that edge before I go out and do any, any serious cutting. But distal taper, yes. Five millimeters down to two and a half. So about 50% reduction gives it a flex. Interestingly, just about where that Yelman transition is, and we'll, we'll definitely be talking about that Yelman quite a bit today. Um, seems like it's kind of thin for its width, but it, it, it has to be to keep the weight down. It's, it's not terribly floppy. Yes, it, it does make some nice ringing sounds that we'll also talk about a little bit today. Reminds me a lot of those semi-Qing dynasty style Chinese Dao I was training with way back when in terms of blade shape and profile. Yeah, it reminds me of that quite a bit. Now finish on the blade. It's, it's more satin than a lot of cold steel offerings that tend to come to you with a, like a chrome mirror polish, you know, machine polish. This one, this one is more satiny, which is nice. Three fullers that run up to that well, not very well done, Yelman. Again, we'll talk about that quite a bit today. They are even, but not, not super crisp, but not super, super blobby either. It's a little bit soft. Now, finish on the blade in terms of machining. It's interesting, this first half of the blade, side planes and the spine are very flat, but about an inch before you get to the Yelman, things start to get uneven and just a bit lumpy. I could feel it. I can see it a little bit. I don't know if it's showing up at all in the camera, but yeah, I think that's where it's, it's showing some cost cutting right there. All right. Yelman could be more pronounced, this, this place here where the blade gets wider to give it more tip authority, but I really feel like that needed to have a swedge or bevel, a false edge of some kind. I think this was a massive, massive missed opportunity to just make it flat in the back. So yeah, I'm going to try to do something about that too. But let's get down to the other end of the weapon and, and talk about some other things. Another thing about fit and finish, the slot where the blade goes into the guard, it's, it's really, th yeah, pretty fine. There's not much gap on either side. Very even, pretty tight. I can see a little bit of what looks like epoxy in there talk about the guard in a second. But one of the stats I was not expecting is the weight. Three pounds, four ounces. So 1,474 grams, which puts it square in what I've come to call my heavyweight category. Not something I was expecting in what should be a shorter, lighter, quicker <laughs> one-handed blade. But it compensates for that somewhat in terms of point of balance. Not so much steel in the blade versus all the steel that, yeah, there's some more ringing. Steel you're going to see in the grip. Um, point of balance is at two and a quarter inches, about five and a half centimeters. So pretty close to the hand. And the hand does sit very close to the guard. But let's talk about this end. Very impressed. It's a lot more solid than it looked like in the pictures. And the construction is also pretty surprising. Now, it is a threaded construction. It's not peen, so that is a sleeve nut. And then you've got a pommel, and then you've got a race skin grip with a wire cover. Now, it has a Turk's head wire braid at the bottom, but oddly not at the top. And then a wire wrap. Now, I've already had to do some smoothing, because not only was the race skin really spiky, this, this reminds me a lot of the grips on my two cold steel basket hilts, which I've come to really like, but had to do a little smoothing on it. The biggest problem, the seam, the overlap, which is on the finger side of the guard, the knuckle bow side of the, of the grip, um, yeah, that was really uneven and had some hot spots that needed to be trimmed actually a little bit to make it fit better. So a little bit of work and that feels a whole lot better than it did out of the box. Grip length, it's about four and a half inches from the top of the guard down to this bevel here. This bevel in the pommel, it kind of reminds me of a cross between, say, a disc pommel 
and say a Viking era sword grip, but yeah, the shapes are really nice and fit the hand really well. So you can you can choke way down and sink your hand in there, lock it in. It feels really, really good. And the blade is stout enough to compensate. I mean, the grip is stout enough to compensate for the meat in the in the blade and the rest of the sword. I feel like when I have a heavier sword, I need a stouter grip to have better control over it, and this delivers. Let's talk about the talk about the guard. All right, so S curve Quillens, knuckle bow, side ring, sidebars with these little embellishments. I'm not sure if they're supposed to be pine cones or what. If you know what they're called, please tell me in the comments. Not super, super crisp, but well done and no seams. There's no casting lines. Everything is really smooth and solid and tight and snug. But more surprisingly, the shells on either side, they're thinner metal, obviously, but this is all, the guard is all one piece. It's not separate sections. I'm used to shells being separate from bars. This is all somehow welded together or one casting. I'm not quite sure. can't really say any weld lines. It looks like it's one solid casting. Now, ring, as I mentioned, in the blade, but also, yeah, you're hearing that. That's because the shells, as they're folded over here, they kind of contact the, the sidebars a little bit. So, you know, they, they knock into them, give you that, give you that noise. I'm not sure if I like it or, or not yet, but it's just a feature of the sword. But feels exceptionally good in hand for the weight, balance, talk a little bit about handling but up front I'm actually surprised it's certainly a workout it's got weight to it but I can move it around so let me get out and do a couple of things to the blade that I feel like I just personally need to and then we'll come back see how it turned out and I'll do a little bit more handling Quick existential interlude before we get back to our regularly scheduled programming, because I have a bit of an issue with Cold Steel calling this a pirate cutlass. And yes, indeed, they put the word pirate in quotations in the name of the product. It's not like pirates had their own dedicated weapons manufacturing industry. They used what was handy and what made sense, and a cutlass is certainly a fantastic sidearm for close quarters combat on something like a ship. I feel like this is just another example of an unfortunate popular association like gangster gun say those two words together something fairly specific probably popped into your heads but what we're probably talking about here is a weapon that was designed for military use and through one path or another got into the hands of a group of individuals that put it to some very specific and infamous use and the association stuck. They didn't make the weapon. It wasn't designed by them. It wasn't designed for them. They were not the intended user, and they were absolutely not the exclusive user. And what we're talking about here is a cutlass. Or is it? Now, as I mentioned in the earlier part of the video, I had some questions about this. There wasn't a lot of information out online. So I asked some questions on a couple of the sword groups that I'm a member of on Facebook. Does anybody know anything more about this particular sword or design? And I got back one very, very interesting reply from Brian Owens on all swords. And it was this. Yeah, looks very similar, right? What are we looking at? This is the Deltin German Dusak. Yeah, and you can certainly see where Windless or Cold Steel or whoever made mine borrowed, well, probably more than liberally from the design. There are some differences. If you look at it closer, the blade shape is fairly identical, but the fullers are different. Uh, the grip is wire-wrapped. The construction is peened instead of, you know, threaded. Uh, the biggest difference, I think, but also the biggest similarity is if you look at the guard from the right side, it, it looks almost identical. But over on the left side, it's not ambidextrous. It's got bars that sweep up into actually a top ring. So it's a little bit different. So is what I have more properly called a sack? Well, let me know what you think in the comments. And back to our regularly scheduled programming. All right, it's been a couple of days in my timeline. I made some improvements to the edge, put more of a fine apple seed on it, and yes, I did also put 
a bit of a false edge on the Yelman. I didn't want to take off a lot of metal because I didn't want to make the this end of it f any more flexible than it already is, which is, well, a little bit more flexing towards the tip now, but let's talk about edge results. Oh yeah. That is just about shaving sharp. What about some cardboard? All right, now the back edge isn't super, super sharp. It does have a fairly steep angle on it. So, yeah, depending on where I catch it, I, I can cut paper this way. It's a little bit more of a sawing action. But on the back edge, let's, let's try that Kyle test. So I'm going to just pierce it through here. It does have a very broad tip, but oh my gosh. Yeah, once it gets in there and gravity takes over, it just, it just slices. Uh, same test with the true edge is, um, yeah. Let's talk about handling. All right, it's been several days for me. I'm not sure if I'm done reprofiling the blade yet, but I kind of like it where it's at. Not only did I do the edges, I did some reshaping to the spine, a couple of spots that weren't quite even for me. While I was at it, I made that Yelman hook a little bit more pronounced and hopefully less of a stress riser. All in all, that's taken an ounce of steel off the blade so far. It's made it, well, just that much quicker in the hand. Talk about handling here in a second. But speaking of in hand on this end, didn't do much. I put a, a little braided leather riser at the top of the grip, gives my fingers a comfortable place to index to so they're not accidentally running into the sharper edges of the shell. I also mentioned, yes, I did smooth out the seam on the ray skin. And while I was at it, I pried the shells out so they're no longer colliding with the sidebars so I'm not getting that broken ringing sound. This is still a um, very very musical sword. It is a threaded construction. I got so far as getting the end nut off and, and that was it. Everything else is thoroughly epoxied in place and I did not want to force it. Now if this starts to loosen up I will take another shot at taking it apart but no I haven't seen the tang yet. But let's talk about handling and cutting a little bit. It has enough weight that I feel like, yes, I'm getting a good workout. It feels like it has good authority in the cut, but it moves, for me, very quickly and nimbly. Not having too much trouble maneuvering this in my practice. And like I said, I've been using this not only as a uh, cutlass, but also a Dusak messer, whatever. I'm doing a little back sword with it as well, just because it's, it's, you know, something I can use a shorter sword in the house to practice that. Now, when it comes to the guard, kind of like a basket hilt, there's spots where it does get in your way a little bit. And for me, well, when I roll tight this way, it's not too bad. Run into it a little bit with my wrist. On the outside here, yeah, I do collide with those bars just a little bit more have to choke down a little bit if I want to do that. Thrusting. It's got enough of a curve to it that it thrusts like a saber. So better at going around corners than straight in line with the arm. But certainly functional for those purposes. Now cutting. Yeah, as I've mentioned in recent videos, Weather for the second year in a row not cooperating. Went from summer into an early non-stop rainy season and now it's snowing. Don't have any covered areas in my backyard to protect my equipment. So until I figure that out and uh, or get a break in the weather, that's going to have to wait. Now I did manage to take a very, very quick opportunity when I had a break in the rain to run outside for a whole three minutes and cut up some of the heavier sword boxes that I'd collected. And I took the opportunity to do some cutting with this and that Murasame 
Unakubi Zukiri T10 that I recently reviewed. And against those boxes, they both did equally well, which is to say this one did impressively well. It slid through that corrugated cardboard with no problem whatsoever, uh, like a big old slicey knife. So I am really looking forward to the opportunity to get out and do, well, a lot more cutting with it, and hopefully this time on camera. And by the time I get around to it, it's probably going to take the form of some comparison cutting videos, and hopefully you'll see those sooner rather than later. But until then, or whatever I get myself into next, thanks as always for watching following my journey, subscribing to the channel, liking the videos, adding to our conversation in the comments if you have any questions about this or you know anything about this sword or we can talk about similar blades. Let's get that going and I hope to see you back for whatever comes next.